So welcome everyone to a, another edition of the Fresh Air series. Um, so we're doing something special today. We're going to do um, a multidisciplinary discussion to kind of show what happens behind the scenes in these discussions um, for interstitial lung disease. Um, and you'll notice if you've been following these sections that we're all pathologists here. So we're going to take off our pathologist hats and and just for this, um, we're, for YouTube, we're going to play different roles. So in this, uh, Dr. Sanjay Mukhopadhyay is going to um, be our pulmonologist or respirologist in this case. Um, and I'll be the uh, radiologist. So I'm not a radiologist for your life, but I play one on YouTube. Um, and then uh, last but not least, uh, Dr. Sensano is going to be our pathologist in case, which she also is in, in real life. And so we're going to do this MDD discussion and we're going to talk about some example type of cases. And so um, usually in these rounds, the pulmonologist or, or, or respirologist will present the history first. And so I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Mukhopadhyay who's going to talk about our first case here. Okay, thank you, Matt. As you um, know, MDD means multidisciplinary discussion. And usually the three disciplines are, you know, a pulmonologist, a radiologist, and a pathologist. So I'm going to start with the first patient. I was thinking of saying, doing this in a little, um, you know, bass voice, Mr. Uh, Mr. X was from Michigan, you know, like a true pulmonologist <laughs> would do. Mr. X came to us from Michigan. He's a, uh, he's a 76 year old guy, really nice gentleman. Uh, he's been, he's been feeling a little, you know, under the weather for about a year. Um, it's been getting a little worse since October, um, little cough, dyspnea. He went over to my friend, uh, Dr. Gross over in um, um, Wisconsin and Dr. Gross treated him a little bit with steroids, gave him a little z pack. nothing happened. He didn't improve. And then he went over to uh, the uh, University of uh, Cincinnati. Then he went over to uh, Penn and nobody could help him. So he came over here and he said, Doc, I'm, you know, I'm just not getting better. It's been about, about nine months. Um, so, you know, he gets uh, short of breath when he walks about, you know, a, a, if, if he walks up a flight of stairs, it's been getting worse over the past, eh, about a, a year or so. Um, no treatments have helped. So I took a little history, you know, uh, he worked as a, uh, just an office, you know, he, he was just an office worker, had desk job, no exposures. Um, his dad was a welder, but no, no uh, exposures. His, you know, his mom was a homemaker. Um, family history, not no family history of uh, pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, no birds in the home. Uh, no hot tubs. He does have a feather pillow, but he he swears it has nothing to do with that. Um, let's see what else. Um, he doesn't take any drugs other than the occasional, you know, cholesterol medication. He takes a, you know, uh, uh, vitamin D and he, this and that, but no drugs, no nitroferantoin, no amiodarone, nothing that uh, I could find in his uh, history that would help. So I don't know what to do with this guy. You know, I, I figured out um, that he's, um, he has interstitial lung disease, but I'm going to let uh, Dr. Cicchini talk about that. Is radiology in the house, by the way? Yeah, yeah, radiology is here, yeah. Is Pat here? Is Pat, is Pat here? Who's, who's here from PATH? Dr. Okay. Fonsano. Okay, all right. I'm here, I'm here. <laughs> all right, because we need the answer from you at the end. Um, so, um, so yeah, so he had, so when he came into our office, he brought an x-ray with him and uh, it just showed coarse markings on, you know, bilateral coarse markings. And, you know, our differential at that point was, um, you know, could this guy have some kind of uh, CTDILD or drug reaction or, you know, something idiopathic? I, we didn't know. But it looks like from the history that he doesn't have anything going on. Uh, so we did a, a high resolution chest CT and I'm gonna let uh, Dr. Cicchini talk about that. Great, thanks. Okay, so let's pick this up and then. Perfect. Can everyone see the screen there? Yep. Okay, so first, this is the uh, chest x-ray that I believe he came in with. Um, and as you described nicely, there are um, coarse bilateral um, uh, interstitial markings here across it. And so we did the high resolution CT scan here. Um, and as you can see, we have these reticular markings that have a peripheral predominance on the outside here. This cuts from more of the basal aspect of the lungs. And so you'd see on the sagittal films as well that the, um, the, 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 it's a more has a basal predominance to it. And then we have these 
spaces here, this honeycomb change, as we say, with these kind of thick walled cystic spaces kind of lining on top of each other. Um, I always like to say that to be a honeycomb, they have to be the size that a bee could crawl into. And I think many of these, we could get multiple bees at least in each of these things. And then there's also some traction bronchiectasis here as we have these airways that are dilated and expanded as they get out towards the periphery here. So the radiological differential for this case, would, this would be most likely a, a usual interstitial pneumonia type pattern. Um, on imaging, uh, I don't see any features that would be against it. And so the radiology in this would be most consistent with a, with a UIP pattern. So Matt, uh, can you show us, because there's a lot of fellows, you know, a lot of our pulmonary mm -hmm. fellows are in the audience. Can you just show us um, where the honeycomb uh, changes and like, why is that not em emphysema? Why is that not? Uh... Yeah, so, so I think that, that area right there, I think I've circled in yellow there is a nice area of honeycomb change. And the reason it's not emphysema is because it has these white um, surrounding areas around it. It's this thick walled spaces here. And so emphysema, you shouldn't really see these this thick walled um, change to it. It's really just empty spaces of lung. And so let's see that, that we have the, all these areas highlighted in this, this more dense area is would be in keeping with honeycomb change. I see. Now, my colleague, Dr. Boondoggle from uh, Pennsylvania, brought up this uh, question of uh, sarcoidosis. Mm. So do you see any features of sarcoidosis on the, what would you see if there was sarcoidosis? Well, sarcoidosis, um, th this is the wrong uh, um, series to look at, but we'd want to look at the mediastinum and, and make sure that um, there's no enlarged lymph nodes that are calcified. But sarcoidosis can also um, cause an interstitial lung disease as well. And so I think um, they can have overlapping patterns to to to, to uh, um, the appearance, but I just play a radiologist on TV. So I would defer that more challenging question to someone who um, is more board certified in radiology than I am. Now, let me tell you that, you know, when I saw this CT, I, I didn't have your expertise, Matt. So, you know, but I thought uh, this is probably UIP, IPF. And uh, the reason that we sent this patient for a biopsy is that the outside radiologist was not you know, uh, fully committal as to whether this was UIP, and so we thought we we really needed a biopsy in this guy. I was gonna I was gonna start him on on our and you know our new antifibrotic drugs, and and uh, before we did that, we wanted to have a, a definitive diagnosis. Uh, if I knew that it was clear cut, you know, UIP by radiology, I wouldn't have I wouldn't have even yeah. gone for a biopsy. So let's turn it over to Path. Path, are you in the house? Where's yes. Path? Yeah, here yeah, yeah. we got the. The biopsy, I'm surprised to see the radiological findings. I'm going to share my screen. This is the biopsy. What do you see? I don't know. They haven't written where the biopsy was taken from, which lobe. I guess it's upper lobes because I don't see here the honeycomb we were seeing in the duck, in the city, sorry. You see. Uh, what we see here is um, a section of lung where that, that it's affected uh, patchy, the, in a patchy way. In a patchy way, it, it, it is more, it has fibrosis here and it's more normal here. If we go down, we see that here we, we cannot see um, honeycomb. But we could say we see some some destructuration that the the structure of the of the lung is is a bit lost. We I saw also we see some inflammation in the in the fibrotic areas. Now, Dr. Sansano, can I ask you what those blue uh, round things are? The blue. These yeah. are follic follicles. Are, so are that, follicles. Um, your colleague, uh, your colleague, uh, um, Doctor, uh, what's her name? I forget her name. She once said that um, when you see those, that means a connective tissue disease-related uh, ILD. So when you see many, and especially in my opinion, when you see it in preserved lung and in in airways and in pleura, I I like to to comment that an inter, uh, uh, CT, 
CTD should be looked for. But in, in a case where there is fibrosis, we many times see some follicles and, and have no meaning. These follicles have no meaning. Mm -hmm. Do you see we, don't see, we don't see many. We don't, I don't see many. I don't see many. It's a pink biopsy, not a blue biopsy. And what I what I was about to say was that I could find some fibroblastic foci, not a lot, but this is patchy fibrosis, some fibroblastic foci. And what is more important, the normal, we see normal lung that has no inflammation and no other features. So it could be it it, it could could be UAP low confidence with uh, joining these findings with the TC, it's, it could be a, a UAB. Yeah, so, so if we, we told you in the lower lobes, there was lots of honeycomb change and it looks like those just weren't sampled from a radiology perspective, would that fit with a UIP? Yes, if, if, the, if I got uh, the biopsy from the lower lobes, I don't know the, where the biopsy comes from, uh, but, but I, I guess it's, it's not from the most uh, affected area. Now, do you see any features of uh, hypersensitivity pneumonitis? No. What I would you what know? I would like to see if it was a if hypersensitivity pneumonitis, I would like to see a bronchiolocentric inflammation like this bronchial. You can see it's normal, and I would like to see some giant cells or some granulomas or something. And and the lung that is not uh, that has no fibrosis is perfectly normal. Okay, that's helpful. So it sounds like we have a consensus around uh, UIP. Would that yeah, fit with I the think, clinical uh, picture? Yeah, I think that it's helpful to know that there's nothing else going on on the biopsy. It's also helpful to know that you have a pretty high confidence of uh, um, your UIP diagnosis on CT. And frankly, if, we, if I knew that before, maybe we could have spared this patient a biopsy and not gone to biopsy at all. Um, because I, I really don't, from the clinical point of view, this um, is, there's no obvious cause to this patient's disease. So that fits with uh, IPF or idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. I'm going to call him into my office and have a discussion about the antifibrotics. Sounds great. Okay, well, let's, I think we have a busy schedule here for our MDD rounds. Maybe we should keep forging ahead to our next one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think you saw this patient as well, Dr. Mukhopadhyay. Yeah, say? this is Mrs. Y. She's a very nice lady from um, uh, California. Came mm. all the way here because the hospitals there are really they're they're awful. Uh, our hospital is the best in the country. <laughs> but she came to us. She's a, she has just a long history of um, scleroderma. Poor lady has been suffering from it for a long time. Mm. Has had esophageal problems. You know, problems with um, you know with aspiration and stuff like that. And um, has had lots of difficulties throughout her life, multi-system problems. And now over the past maybe um, uh, two years or so, she's been having problems with her uh, breathing. So she's mm -hmm. been having a little bit of a dry cough on and off. Um, and she, you know, I, I tried to get a history of whether it was somehow related to her environment. She has any, you know, pet birds at home or a hot tub mm -hmm. or anything, or whether it gets more when she leaves her house. It doesn't seem like there's any relation to to any kind of exposure source or an antigens. There's no other um, family history of uh, interstitial lung disease. I did uh, pursue the aspiration angle, you know, because she has scleroderma and this uh, esophageal problems. It doesn't seem like she, is, she has any problems with GERD, at, at least not at the current time. Maybe there's some old, so that we will be very interested in seeing whether there's anything that's related to aspiration, the biopsy and on, this, on the CT. But, um, Mostly, she just gives a very non-specific history of, of cough and, and uh, shortness of breath. We did her pulmonary function tests, and she does have a, a restrictive pattern. So, mm. she, and she, she does have a little bit also of a, of a reduced DLCO. So, we're really um, we're really stuck here. She's relatively young, and uh, I just want to make sure that she doesn't have something that we could treat with a immunomodulator. So, we need uh, you guys' help. So, Dr. Chikini, what what could you? 
Definitely. And so unfortunately, we couldn't get the, the, the films from this case because they're from California, but uh, and, and they didn't arrive here in time for our review. I think the CT is in the mail somewhere, but um, 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 I was able to go through the reports and um, it sounds like there was a good read of it and um, their description um, is is somewhat of a non-specific finding. There's some ground glass and some particular markings. There's maybe a little bit of subpleural sparing that they've noted. Um, and uh, the there's some pertinent negatives too in the report. And so we don't see any honeycomb change um, there. And there's really not a lower low predominance uh, of the findings. Um, they're kind of more diffuse um, in nature. And the ground glass is largely associated with the reticular markings. And they also noted that the, the esophagus was a bit patchless and which would be in keeping with the history of scleroderma. And so um, these features are, aren't specific, um, but um, they um, could be in keeping with a non-specific interstitial pneumonia pattern. But um, um, I, I should note that we don't really have specific features to tell us that on radiology and that, um, you know, if, if the biopsy does show, you know, features of UIP, that that's still possible as an early UIP. And so mm -hmm. I would favor an NSIP, but in, in these type of cases, I would definitely defer to pathology. You see anything to suggest aspiration? Because that's really the other major concern here. Uh, like I said, so that wasn't commented in the report, um, but uh, um, I, I, I don't think that they commented on any features of aspiration. But given that history of that patchless esophagus, they definitely could be aspirating. OK, that's, uh, that's very helpful. So uh, let's path. move to the biopsy findings, yeah. So here I got the, this biopsy. Uh, we, I have this section of, of lung where you can see that compared to the, the previous one, we see many of these blue balls. This, this biopsy has a blue filling. When we go, and, and, and it's not patchy, it's diffuse. Whatever it's happening is happening to the whole section. And when we get closer, we see that the interstitium is thick. That is thick with, uh, and it has uh, inflammation on it. It has these follicles and it has some lymphoplasma cellular infiltrate. The bronchioles also have some inflammation. There is bronchiolitis, cellular bronchiolitis. And I haven't seen any food particle or so. These are crystals. But I haven't seen any any food particle or something that that made me think about aspiration. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely. Something, uh... something else I wanted to show you. I haven't seen uh, pleuritis, but I saw this here. Sorry. I saw this um, adherence, this thing that I think it's an adherence. And I was taught that when there is a pleural adherence, uh, there, it's a sign that there has been a pleuritis before in this, in this area. So I think I would call this biopsy NSIP with lymphoid follicles, uh, lymphoid follicles, and I would add a note that you you should check that it goes for a okay with a collagen vascular disease. Okay, that's helpful. So you don't see any uh, UIP features, correct? No, the I don't see normal lung. Well, here is the most normal lung, but you can see it's not completely normal it has an inflammation and it's the only the only part i, I don't see uh, fibroblastic foci i don't see normal lung and i don't see honeycomb then i uh, this is not a uip it's defined yeah. definitely not uip so i think for the purpose of the mdd discussion and for the registry we're going to label this as a ctdild or a scleroderma associated nsip if that's okay with both of you do you agree with that yeah. Final. Mm -hmm. I think that's fine. And we'll, you know, what we'll do is have a talk with her about her immunomodulation. Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll have to switch it because she's not doing that great on steroids. Maybe switch it to another immunomodulator or maybe, you know, down the line, move to an antifibrotic. We'll have that discussion with her. 
Okay, thank, thank you both. Thank you. Okay, so I think we're moving the last case of our agenda here. And so um, I think uh, you saw this patient as well. You look like you had a busy day in clinic there, Dr. Mukhopadhyay. Busy day in clinic, you know. <laughs> these huh. Californians are just not doing a good job with their patients. <laughs> All right, so um, should we start with the case three? Yeah, that'd yeah. be great, thanks. Yeah, so this is a, a very nice lady. She's from the um, south of the country. I forget mm. which state she's from. Came here with her husband, uh, very nice uh, people. She's been, she has a very interesting history in that, um, you know, she gets very short of breath and, um, you know, starts coughing when she goes, uh, when she is at her house. But when she goes on vacation to Florida, everything clears up. Oh. I'm like, uh, so what is going on? So what's going on in your home? And it turns out that she has um, a parakeet that she's, mm. yeah, she's got a parakeet that she's had uh, for many years. She really loves this thing. She's not willing to get rid of it, actually. She, mm. She's very, very attached to it. It's like the family pet. And uh, I broached that discussion with her, you know, the idea of trying to... Um, see if you know, she could get away from it for a while. But other than the occasional vacation, she doesn't. And then when she comes back home, she gets very, very symptomatic. And you know, it seems like uh, there's some sort of a relationship to that. And, but there's, that's, that's what her symptoms are, cough and dyspnea, which are sort of episodic. And it's been getting more and more to the point that now it's, uh, she's getting, you know, her shortness of breath is getting really, really debilitating. And, um, I think I have to now convince her of what the diagnosis is before I try to, you know, um, uh, you know, persuade her to at least get away from this bird for a little while. But we need to have a definitive diagnosis because there's several alternative things. She had a brother who she said had some kind of a lung disease in the past. So familial IPF is something we're thinking about. Um, we're worried about other things. You know, she doesn't take any drugs. There's no nitroferantoin or amiodarone no immune checkpoint inhibitor for any reason. So I don't think that this is drug related, but there is the question of whether this can be some sort of familial um, interstitial lung disease. Could this be, you know, she has a, she had a little raised ANA at some point and uh, she's occasionally had a rash. So we were thinking, could this be some sort of IPAF or along that spectrum mm -hmm. of things? So we, that's our differential here. Is it IPAF, familial IPF, um, hypersensitivity. So we're hoping you guys can shed some light on that. Definitely. So we have the, the films on, the, on this case. So let me see if I can share these. Okay. Do you see the slide there? Yep. Perfect. And so uh, this case is, uh, um, is a very uh, um, classic example of the finding here so much so that um, it was a colleague of ours that uh, saw this case and we've actually it was part of a teaching presentation for some residents and and I think it nicely demonstrates some of the findings that we would see here in um, in, in hypersensitivity uh, pneumonitis or HP um, and so it's often referred to as the head cheese sign based on um, this um, I believe it's got a type of lunch meat or some kind of delicatessen meats where they have this uh, meat embedded in this gelatin like material which I have to admit I've never actually tried myself but um, I, I don't I don't don't really know if it's good or not but um, but so this is the the picture of this this head cheese, and then the, this is these are the images some from the, the films here, and so what we describe is this mosaic attenuation where we see varying densities um, that range from this ground glass, which we have nicely in this orange area, arrow, to these less dense areas, which are these air trapping with this purple arrow arrow here. And it's diffusely throughout the lungs here. Um, often you can see an upper lobe predominance as well. And one of the keys to the diagnosis here are these expiratory films. And so these are taken um, in the expi expiratory phase of respiration. And this can make the features of hypersensitivity pneumonitis more pronounced. And this really brings out this mosaic attenuation where we see these areas of lower density of which are 
air trapping. And it likely relates to the fact that a lot of the disease process is going on around these airways that prevents the air from getting out in the expiratory, expiratory phase. And so it really makes these features more pronounced. And so from a radiology standpoint, this would be most in keeping with a hypersensitivity pneumonitis or chronic HP. Um, there's, there's not um, definitive features of short telomeres or other familial features of interstitial lung disease on imaging. Um, and uh, there's not really great features for uh, that would tell us it's connective tissue disease ILD either. So from the radiology standpoint, we can't do much in terms of, of, of helping that, at least from my perspective as a pseudo-radiologist. Okay, that's, so that's helpful. I think uh, uh, the radiologist at the outside facility was not that, um, you know, wasn't that sure, gave a big differential diagnosis for okay. ground glass opacities. And that's why we, we went to biopsy because we weren't con completely sure whether there was a differential for this, but sounds like you're pretty, pretty confident that this is a hypersensitivity. Yeah, with that degree of air trapping, that, that that's, is, is um, increases my confidence, but there always is a differential for these things, especially yeah. in the ground glass. I think yeah. that's why path can be helpful because yeah. we've seen cases over the years where it looks uh, pretty compelling and then the path just turns out to be completely different. So we wanna mm -hmm. just make sure. So uh, Dr. Sansano, what do you have for us? What's the answer? Well, in this, in this time, I, I completely agree with Dr. Chicken. Mm -hmm. I'm going to, to show you in a minute. Um, here you see uh, the, the lung sections where, where you, you see again a patchy, um, a, 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 a patchy pattern. And it's, a, it's again blue. We see inflammation. We can imagine this. When we get closer, we see this, the distribution of this blue. In, blue is around bronchioles. Then we see bronchiolocentric pneumonitis. And here, inflammation. Um, in the periphery, we see less. We don't see fibrosis. We don't see fibroblast. Well, here in the periphery, we see a lot, but <laughs> we don't see um, fibrosis, we don't see fibroblastic foci. Uh, do you see, uh, can you show us some of the, the granulomas? Cause they're, you know, just for our fellows to see what they look like, the granulomas or- I'm know. looking for them here. You see bronchiolitis. Here I saw some very beautiful in this section, for example. Easy to find because there, there, had, there were calcif calcification on it. This is a giant cell with calcifications. Probably cannot see the, the giant cell, but it's there. Um, this is a, a harder to believe one, but you have to, to believe that these guys here are forming a granuloma, but this is, are the kind of granulomas that HP mm. has. And there are many others like this here again. Mm -hmm. So what is that stuff in there? Is that something she's uh, aspirating or inhaling yeah. or what is that material it's, in there? It's a, a product of metabolism. It's not, it's not aspirating. It's aspirated material. It happens in, in, in HP, it, ha it happens also in, in sarcoidosis. It's not, not aspirated. Okay. Because she worked for a little while in some sort of a chemicals plant or something. And I was just worried that she might be inhaling something that might be damaging her lung or, you know, vaping or something. But that's, that's not what you see here, right? Okay. That's all. It's a bronchiolocentric pneumonia, interstitial pneumonia, okay. uh, and and it's um, it, it's according with your history or with with your suspicion of, of HP. Yeah, well, that fits. You know, she has a very characteristic combination of obstructive and restrictive disease. She has a very compelling exposure source. She's been responding fairly well to to corticosteroids, but I think the key here is going to be to convince her to you know, stay away from the bird or get rid of the bird, that's going to be quite a challenge to do because, you know, 
there's an emotional connection there. But it really helps to have this MDD discussion. And our mm -hmm. final diagnosis is uh, hypersensitivity neuritis. Sounds great. Well, I think those are three excellent cases and examples of how MDD can be utilized to arrive at um, um, a, a diagnosis for patients to help improve their care. Um, I just thought we could take a few minutes and, and discuss some of the challenges that, um, from at least from the pathology perspective, now I'm taking my hat off as a pseudoradiologist, um, that we can, we can discuss um, as a yeah. group. For sure. See, um, Matt, I think we should all discuss how, how it happens in our places because one of the, the problems with MDD is there is no definition of what an MDD is or how many people there should be or how the final the diagnosis is made. It's very haphazard, you know? Mm -hmm. Like you, you get three people in a room, which is great. It's very, very good to have each other's perspective. But then how that, you know, how a diagnosis comes out of that is very arbitrary. And I think one of the biggest problems in our setting is that anything that has a diagnosis actually doesn't come to MDD. Okay. So the things that have, an, have a clear-cut diagnosis are never never even brought to MDD. We only bring the cases that don't have a diagnosis. So by definition, the biopsies we have are either non-diagnostic or they're, not, they're non-specific, there's no answer. And the you know there's nothing. So we are dealing with the toughest of the tough cases that don't have an answer. It's very, very frustrating for everyone mm -hmm. involved. I don't know how it is that, do you discuss all your ILD cases at your MDDs? We don't discuss all of them. We discuss um, a larger proportion, probably. Just um, we, we we likely don't have the volume that you have, and so there actually is a nice mix of cases that are very challenging. But then there's also um, included cases that have actually some classic findings, and so um, it's um, a little bit uh, easier in a way, right? And it's it's often good for the because we have our, our trainees join as well as the clinical trainees and radiology trainees that join as well, and so it can be more of an educational opportunity as well for not only going over these challenging cases, which often don't have um, a clear cut answer, but also some classic cases where there, where it does all fit um, from the radiology, the pathology, and the clinical side. Yeah. So Irene, like I, I find at our place that um, often they're, you know, in these difficult cases, they're not really looking for a pathology answer because they already know there is no answer from the pathology. You know, they have a report, the report states, you know, that it's non-diagnostic, non-specific, whatever, but they're often looking for um, advice from ILD docs, you know, experienced ILD docs. Other, other people are calling in to ask, what should I do next? So the pathology said this, the radiology said that, What's my option? How do I treat? What else can I do in terms of biopsy? What should I tell the patient? So do you have that kind of thing there that you, you know, it's more of a treatment management problem rather than diagnostic or is it mostly diagnostic? No, it's the same. We don't, we also, we, we do like, like Matt said, more or less, we don't discuss all, but we try to put some to reinforce our, <laughs> but uh, this is, the, the most that we have, and you know, I work with cryobiopsies, then I have a lot of non-diagnostic biopsies. And what I, I feel that, that they, they don't want to own that to take the, to, to give a treatment or to put a label only with one person's opinion. It's most in what I, what I have to show in the biopsy, they have some questions. It's like, oh, we are going to give steroids. Is there inflammation? Is that just a specific questions? Not the, the, diagnostic, the diagnosis because they already know that the, the biopsy has not a diagnosis. Yeah. What do you find? So let me ask both of you, what is the thing that you find best about MDD? Like how is it the most helpful? And then what is the thing that's most frustrating about MDD? Maybe I can, I can start. Um, the the um, I think the most helpful is in these challenging cases where everyone kind of has a non-diagnostic situation, right? Where radiology is kind of there, but kind of non-diagnostic. Pathology is kind of there, but non-diagnostic. And the clinical side are also the same, right? And so, because everyone has one piece of the puzzle, right? And um, each of us don't have enough pieces on our own to say this is what it is. But when you take everyone's one piece and you put it together, then you get enough to put paint the whole picture and put it together. And, and I think that that is the idealized world of of um, of um, 
MDD. Um, but as we all know, that often is not the case, right? Where right. that you know, it's things are still in the gray zone, yeah. and you're there's really not clear evidence of of one thing or the other. And those those are some the cha most challenging cases I find is when there's just not enough in any one thing, and we don't really know what's going on. And 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 it's frustrating because you feel like you're just at the same point as you started, and you're just kind of making your best educated decision of, of of where it is but exactly exactly same same for me irene how is how is your what's your best and worst for the mdd the it's a bit uh, i i i like when <laughs> there are so many times that that what we see has nothing to do with what the radiologist uh, says that that it's crazy because it's the same patient and we should it, it should correlate. Then what I when I, what I love is that that it that the patient has a suspicion, and the radiologist then I see a totally different thing. And when mm. this happens, it's like magic. <laughs> oh, I saw the HP. So. Cool. And that that's the the what I like. And what I dislike is sometimes that they they want to to push a bit a diagnosis, no and. And you feel a bit pushed, no? The, mm. Because, well, the, if the biopsy has not enough, if, the, if there is not enough enough tissue, or if there there are not the features, you cannot say, and that's all. And we should all understand that. But sometimes it's like, oh, but it's clear that it has. Well, but it's clear. It's clear in the CT, yes. mm. but not in the biopsy. Yes. This is the part I don't like. I, you know, I agree with that. You know, we are in a slightly different position than a usual laboratory professional. I think we've had this discussion before in, mm. between the three of us. It's different than just reporting a calcium or a hemoglobin level because the, the person who reports a hemoglobin can say it's 8.5 and I don't care what the clinical setting is. You know, it is 8.5. And the problem is, although we also have a, a objective, right? We say there are lymphocytes, there's a granuloma, there's a but then they can put some pressure on us to say what that means, you know? So I think that's where it becomes a little, uh, it's very, very open to personalities, to, mm -hmm. you know, inter, interpersonal dynamics, your, your uh, philosophy of things. It's just not pure science at that point. It's some sort mm -hmm. of art slash politics slash, you know, slash just practical life, you know? It's practical life of dealing with a difficult case where there is no answer. And you're trying to come up with something which is very frustrating. I find that very frustrating. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think that that anchoring bias can be a challenge, right? Where the case comes in as it's this, and the first person that talks is very clear that this is what it is, um, and then that everyone else is trying to put it into that box and, and view the findings within that lens, right? And it's in an idealized situation, you want three completely unbiased opinions and reviews of it. And so that you're not um, stuck on that initial anchoring bias um, from the initial. Mm. We have uh, we have our reports done before. Yeah. But I always have to, I always, I, a lot of guys have to make a note after the, the committee. Mm. So. Just to know that I, well, that I saw something. The, the, some many times I see things a little bit different after they say not changing the diagnosis, but but I like to mm -hmm. write what I what I thought after the the, the multidisciplinary discussion. I, I have a question uh, for you guys. Um, do you sh do you show the images of all the slides in the cases, or you just talk about the findings during the rounds? We show images. We show images uh, for ILD. They find it helpful to see them. I'm not sure why, because I, I really think they don't understand what the image is showing. But, but they like to see it. You know, they like to get some sense of, uh, like I think Irene or you, somebody was saying, they get like to get a sense of, is it mostly inflammatory or mostly fibrotic? You know, are there a lot of granulomas or just a few? I think they also try to read your level of confidence. You know, they say, Oh, you, you know, this just seems like a slam dunk UIP or like you're hesitating, you're describing a lot, which means you're, you're not really, you know, so they, I think they, it helps for them to get a sense of which way you're heading, even if there's no clear cut answer at the end. So I, and I like, I just like to show images. I think it, it does help in ILD just to, to, to get everybody on the same page. 
I, I also show always and also sometimes they what when they want to know if if it, as we as we have cryobiopsies they want to know if they ask for a surgical biopsy mm. if I think if I think that it would be useful to because there are some biopsies that I feel that I could see more if I saw more and, and that's another thing that we discuss yeah same thing happens here too in our, our place also they will ask us if we think that there's any point doing a or what kind of biopsy should we do should we do a conventional transbronch or a cryobiopsy or a surgical biopsy what is the differential will you guys be able to give that answer there's a lot of like uh, useful things that go on even in the non-diagnostic cases um, but some, sometimes we discuss cases that we have a biopsy from some years ago mm. and and they and they have more cities then it like what you see in the biopsy is what do, do we think that is what what is happening now should we get another biopsy this is another thing we discuss in the in the in these discussions and it's maybe it's yeah. interesting sometimes, sometimes we decide sometimes we decide we need a, a new biopsy and sometimes we decide we don't yeah yeah we, we show digitized slides for all the cases um so we can kind of give them that perspective of the whole slide and um and um, we often do um trichrome stains and um, not because you really need it for the diagnosis but it often helps in these rounds um because it, it kind of gives an overall sense of the amount of fibrosis and it can be a, a useful low power um discussion description to show the extent and the distribution of fibrosis because you know it's basically green well if you use a mass on like of you know all, all the green is the fibrotic stuff and uh and so it can be uh um helpful um for people who are, aren't used to looking at um h and e yeah it's just not that impressive i think the h and e because when i show the fibrosis on h and e they're like, mm, mm. And yeah. then i say show the same thing on a movat and they're like ooh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> Movat is, is beautiful. We don't have yeah. this Movat. Yeah, we. Uh, I don't know. I the the Movat is actually more expensive than a Masson. So the the so we often I often order Masson just to save some money. But <laughs> I agree, I, the Movat's nice. I I demanded the Movat and because I see some pictures in in yeah. Twitter and I'm I'm envious and I and I demanded the and they are they said they are going to try to yes. to to make to put it. So for diagnosis, let's see. Awesome. I don't know nobody in in Spain that uses Movet. We use Mason, the blue or the or the or the green one. Yeah, cool. Well, I think it says we're just coming to the close of the hour. I think this has been a great discussion. Is there anything else that anyone wanted to add in the last minute or two? No, I think we covered we covered pretty much everything. <laughs>